Larry Pope. Welcome to the show. Get ready to meet your host of the night. Never gonna bury your kid, his story of himself. Well, hello and good evening, everyone. Um, today is September 10th. Wow, who would have thought it's already September? Gosh. So I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. So thank you all so much for being here. And we've got a great show for you tonight. And I do want to say thank you all for being here. Now, it's basically this happens because of folks just like you that are watching and enjoying the show, as well as I also do have sponsorship from AARP of Arizona. And they like to say the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we are not alone. AARP is here in Arizona providing information that can help you and your family. If you want to check out some of their offerings online, you can do that. Checking out their website at aarp.org slash az. And you'll find they've got some virtual programming that happens, like a drum circle, as well as some other stress relieving things, as well as just how to navigate kind of this moment that we're all in. I will ask you if you're on Facebook, I would love it if you would just share that with all your friends on Facebook so they know how much fun we're having because we have a really amazing show tonight. I am so excited about it. Now, as we go through, there is the chat over on one side so you can ask questions make comments for everyone to see and be a part of and later on we'll talk about the trivia and how you can use that as well now if you also would like to reach out to me after the show you can do that through either instagram hip historian email which is hello at hip historian or even facebook which is where this is coming to a lot of you and so that is Marshall Shore, Hip Historian. And you can find out about other events that are going on. And we'll talk about some of those later. So tonight, oh my gosh. So we're talking about Camelback Inn. We have Frank Barrios, who's going to be coming on later on and sharing lots of great stories about some quirky Arizona history. We're also going to be talking about Happy Jack, a little tiny town. Maybe some of you have seen the sign. Maybe you've driven through it. Or maybe you've just seen the sign as you're in other places. As well as we're going to have our special cocktail tonight, which is called The Last Word. And that comes to us from PJ over at the Valley Ho. And so, yeah, so if you, if you would please share this publicly so that way all your friends will see the fun we're having and you know we're all gonna learn about arizona because it's so much fun what we're going to be talking about well you know i'm not like every week is not i mean it's not i mean it's not like every week isn't fun but this one is going to be super fun so my name is marshall shore i'm also known as the hip historian now you might wonder how does one get a name like the hip historian well you know 20 years ago, I was in Brooklyn working at a library, and this was the library. I actually was the last library I worked in, which was in called Arlington. It was a great Carnegie building. And if you look in the front of the building, you'll see one of the reasons why I decided it was time to move on because of snow. And so decided it was time to load everything up into a U-Haul. Now, you know, a little pedal car like this would not have held everything that I was moving across the country. It also, I mean, I remember coming down that hill. We actually came down that hill from Flagstaff at night, which would have been quite treacherous in a vehicle quite like this. 
and promptly moved into a little 1956 ranch. Now, we like to keep it to period because this is what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, the matching stovetop, the matching wall oven. And if you look close to that oven, you'll notice that there's something missing out of it that might not look like your modern oven, a window. Now, as soon as I got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history, but I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, I came face to face with so many amazing stories. And about a, actually a little over a decade ago, I decided to walk away from libraries and pursue this whole passion of connecting people in place using stories because I realized a lot of people weren't aware of so much of the great history in Arizona. And then there's that post-war boom that I think in a lot of ways made the Arizona that we all know and love. Those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on their way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers, changing Arizona, and in some cases looking for a house just like mine. Now, you know, we started the week a little toasty. And then, you know, temperatures kind of cooled down a bit, especially at night when it was really gorgeous. But, you know, to get us through those days, this man, Willis Carrier, he had a printing firm back in New York and he wanted a way to keep his paper from expanding and contracting. And so he created something called air conditioning. And so that was part of what brought that huge post-war boom out here as well, because now we were able to have these devices that could make us feel like cold miser, comfortable, why we could even just sit back all dressed up and admire our window air conditioning because they were so beautiful. Also, the Phoenix New Times has named me best historian several years in a row, as well as the Phoenix Magazine named me the best special Phoenix celebrity because I do indeed like my eyewear. Now you're probably wondering, what is Marshall wearing? Well, you know, I'm not wearing my Halloween costume, which is kind of like a Poochie-esque black and white clown outfit. And I'll talk more about Halloween a little bit later and some of the things we have coming up for that. But I am wearing a very special suit coat that came about in 2012, February 14th. Every year on Valentine's Day, we have a great celebration for statehood. Back in 2012, we had one heck of a celebration across the state doing all kinds of events, including right in front of the Capitol on Statehood Day. And somebody gave me 15 minutes to talk about anything I wanted to. And I chose one of the most favorite events that I love learning about that most people have never even heard of. It was started back in 1926 by Charlotte Hall, who was a poet, a preservationist. And if you're ever in Prescott, you can actually go visit her home, which was home to territorial governors. She lived in it later, and then it became a museum. So you can go visit her house and get even more history. The event was called Mask of the Yellow Moon. Now it started in 1926 and ran to 1955. It was first held at the Elzebrenner Shriners Temple, just down the street from the Capitol. It later on became the Mine and Mineral Museum. And... In 2012, they actually got kicked out for something that didn't happen, but they are going to be moving back in a few years once they bring that amazing, beautiful building back up to code. So I look forward to them opening up. It was then held at Montgomery Stadium, which was our first stadium here in Arizona. And it hosted all kinds of events. And one of them was called the Salad Bowl. It was our very first bowl game, and it's one of those events that 
drew huge crowds. White even had a parade. And in the parade, you would find the queen of the salad bowl arriving in her very own salad bowl with a spoon and fork to serve with. Now, at the height of Mask of Yellow Moon, it had about 5,000 high school and college students performing in it. It was based on the fact that the sun, the god of sun would give his rays to make the earth golden and warm and make things grow. So it was always a springtime event, and it was touted right up there with Mardi Gras as something that everyone in the country should go and see. Now, it was woven the curriculum so that everybody got involved. You had debate club doing skits. You had students building really large sets. You had multiple marching bands, as well as fields of young ladies dancing in a really great costumes. Now, the costumes were all designed by students and pretty much made by home economic classes. And so I was lucky enough to find a few of these dresses in a box. I was allowed to borrow them for 24 hours, so the clock was ticking. And I was able to convince three lovely friends to don those dresses. And what we're looking at here are dresses from the late 30s. Now, you might have figured out that I'm not a very good wallflower, that I like to stand out in a crowd. And so I needed something that would very much stand up to those amazing dresses. And so I talked to my friend, Glenn, who rolled in town in the early 50s. He was a sign designer. And he is still with us in his early 90s. And he designed a lot of signs, some of which are still standing. One of the signs that he has his hand on is Curtis Chevrolet, probably one of the most iconic signs in the valley, right there on Camelback. And so what he did was he created a suit coat that was an homage to the Arizona state flag. And then it got me going, you know, I'm now up to seven suit coats on a variety of Arizona themes. Now, one of the reasons I always like to start with this story is because you never know where the next story is coming from. And so I was presenting to a group called the First Families of Arizona. And when we were done, one of the members tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, come over here. And went out to her car and she pulled out this amazing dress. And this is her mother's dress that she wore in the Mask of the Yellow Moon. And, you know, I look forward to getting a chance. Now, we know this dress was worn in the late 20s, either 28 or 29. I look forward to finding out exactly when and what number this dress was worn in. And if you'd like to find out more information about First Film is Arizona. They are a proud sponsor of Arizona History Happy Hour. And you can track them down on Facebook or also their website, which is the first film is Arizona.org. T F F O A dot org. And because it is indeed happy hour, we have again, we have our weekly cocktail. Um, this time it is created by the amazing PJ over at the Valley Ho. Now, what he did was he made the Latin word and they made these great little, it's a to-go cocktail. So you just get it. And here is indeed. So what I love about PJ is, I mean, so last week I threw in the cocktail some Luxardo cherries. So he threw in several, a couple different kind of Luxardo cherry based 
dream things. Let's see. And actually, let's go ahead and pull that off. So you can see, I mean, it's got a little bit of Mezcal, a little Patron, some green chartreuse, some Yuzu Lime Limoncello. And I love that he put the coffee beans in there because we, when we first met kind of talking about Arizona History Happy Hour and he offered up the opportunity for him to create cocktails it's like, so that's why he put the coffee beans in there. And he knew I like Luxardo cherries. So that's why he threw in the, the Sangue Morlock, as well as Luxardo Maraschino. And, you know, he hit another home run. Now, these are always available Tuesday evening through Wednesday and Thursday at the Valley Ho. You can just walk in and get your own little jar or sometimes it's a kit because there's things to do which is always kind of fun to create those cocktails now this is a segment i like to call from my collection and so i have a house full of things and so today let's see if you can see oh what helped was right side up so this is an ashtray from the Camelback Inn. So have any ever been to the Camelback Inn? Because you know it opened its doors back in 1936. And one of the major investors was John C. Lincoln. Then in the late 30s, they opened, they finally opened up a bar. It was called the Sleepy Spanish Cantina. And they served 30 cent martinis. I sure wish we could go there and enjoy a martini right now for only 30 cents. It was also where Barry Goldwater had his election night headquarters for his unsuccessful attempt to become the 1964 president. In the late 60s, he sells it to Marriott. And about a decade ago, they went through a huge renovation. And so if you haven't been there, I highly suggest you go and check it out because it's a really cool place to just kind of hang out, get a cocktail, meet friends, even have a staycation there. And you can see there's what it looks like today. There's what it looked like back in the day. It had just a few rooms and they kept adding on to it, adding on to it. And it was really for all those wealthy Easterners that were coming out for vacations. And in many cases, looking for that Wild West experience. And so they did offer it. Now, Mr. Stewart, who originally ran the hotel and opened it um, over where the red dot is, we think that is him in this photo. And so I love how they're all dressed up. I mean, you've got the guy in the cowboy hat, but then you also have folks in bowlers and suits riding their horses. Many of them for the first time. Now, you know, through the miracle of modern technology or ancient technology, I'm happy to bring on a guest. Now, you know, sometimes technology has its own ideas of what's going to happen and that is kind of what we're in today but i do want to bring on my friend frank barrios now i've known frank for quite a while i mean i think we first met i think just running around town but he is a member of the arizona's first families he is an amazing historian and has a ton of stories and he also wrote a book called mexicans in phoenix chronicling a lot of his family, as well as just the culture 
that was here of the Mexicans that were in Phoenix at that time. And so we're going to have all kinds of fun. Hello, Frank. Hello, Marshall. How are you? I am good. How are you doing on this fabulous night? I couldn't be better, and I really appreciate you having me on your program. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. And I guess I could uh, tell people a little bit about myself. I'm an engineer. Uh, my entire working career, uh, I, my entire life has been here in Phoenix, but my working career was uh, in water. And uh, I served uh, uh, several years in the Central Arizona Water, uh, uh, Central Arizona Project Board of Directors. And, uh, and after I retired, I've been very involved in history because my family has a, a, a state, 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 state in uh, the history of uh, Phoenix and Arizona. Uh, my family goes back to when Arizona belonged to Mexico. And uh, my grandfather uh, uh, came from Yugoslavia. And my grandmother was uh, 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 Hispanic from here, Mexican from the valley. And uh, I've got a, a history uh, that I'm very proud of. And, and since I've retired from the water arena, I've been involved in history of Arizona and primarily of Phoenix. And you were saying when, when you were working, you actually went all over the state. Uh, yes, I, I worked for the, uh, the State Department of Water Resources. And before that, I worked for the Bureau of Reclamation. But, uh, and uh, I was the head of flood control for the state of Arizona. I was the head of planning for water for Arizona, AMA director for Pinal County, and for the Phoenix Active Management Area. So I've got a, a history of, uh, like I said, it was uh, all dealing with water. And of course, uh, the reason Arizona and Phoenix is growing is dependent on our water supply. And uh, we constantly have to be looking for new supplies as we continue to grow. Because I mean, it's like, as you look in just the history, water has such a huge history and control and power here. Absolutely. It, uh, we were one of the first uh, reclamation projects in the United States uh, was when they built Roosevelt Dam. And um, uh, uh, Roosevelt, uh, Teddy Roosevelt came down and, and um, uh, dedicated uh, the dam when it was completed. But it was a, one of the, there were several others, but it was one of the very first reclamation projects was here. And of course, uh, today uh, that's administered by the Salt River Project. Uh, we went from one dam to where we have uh, uh, six today on the Salt and Verde Rivers. Indeed. So one thing we always do on every show is we do trivia. And it's not your usual, like if you would go out for trivia, because this is more about sharing the story. So what we'll do is I'll go through the questions. And they're all multiple choice. So even if you don't know the answer, you can take just a sheer guess and you've got a good shot of getting it right. And you can keep track of your answers either on a pad and paper near you or you can throw them into the chat. Whatever you want to do, you go right ahead and do it. All right. So let's go ahead and start. And we've got 20, 10 questions. So our first question is, what is the name of the first Anglo baby born in Arizona? Was it A, Zona Jones? Was it B, Carl Hayden? C, Gila Howard? Or D, Guy Smiley? Which one of those folks was the first Anglo baby born in Arizona? Question two, what was the year when the largest ever Salt River flood occurred in Phoenix? Was it A, 1891, B, 1906, C, 1916, or D, 1920? And question three, 
what famous person is buried on a hilltop just outside of Florence, Arizona? Is it A, Howard Hunt, B, Charles Poston, C, Bucky O'Neill, or D, George Hunt? Which one of those people is buried just outside of Florence on a hilltop? And question four, where was Mobile, Arizona located? A, near Tucson. B, near Maricopa. C, near Page. Or D, near Bisbee. So those places were near, one of those places was nearby a town called Mobile, Arizona. And at the halfway point, question five, who was Benjamin Franklin? Now, not that Benjamin Franklin. It's a different Benjamin Franklin. So was he A, an Arizona state marshal, B, Arizona state secretary of state, C, Arizona state territorial governor, or D, Maricopa constable? So one of those offices was held by Benjamin Franklin. Which one was it? Question six. Who was Hattie Mosier? A, one of the richest women in Arizona. B, the first woman to run for the state legislature. C, an infamous street person. Or D, a bar owner. Who was Hattie Mosier? Question seven, who was the first non-Indian woman to live in Phoenix, Arizona? A, Margaret Loring. B, Elena Garfus. C, Trinidad Escalante. Or D, Marion Lane. Who was the first non-Indigenous woman to live in Phoenix? Question eight, who was the last person to be hung in Arizona? A, Pearl Hart. B, Eva Dugan. C, Rosa Goodrich. Or D, Winnie Ruth Judd. Who was the last person to be hung in Arizona? And we're coming to the home stretch. Two more questions to go. Where is the... Where is the famous Arizona Mormon pioneer Jacob Hanlon buried? Is it A, Mesa, B, Salt Lake City in Utah, C, Alpine, Arizona, or D, Oneida, New York? Which one of those places is where Jacob Hamlin is buried? And our last question, who was the first female admiral of the Arizona Navy? Was it A, Rose Mofford, B, Nellie Bush, C, Charlotte Hall, or D, Big Nose Kate? Which one of those women was the first female Navy admiral for Arizona? All right, while you're all collecting your answers, getting those ready, we're going to take a little bit of an Arizona music break and talk about one of a really amazing place right here in Arizona, Riverside Ballroom. It was pretty much the place to go to. Um, they had tons of music. They had the old Opry came in, so it was kind of a hub of country music. So you had folks like Patsy Klein, but you also had a wide variety of Hispanic entertainers coming to play there. Isn't that right, Frank? Yes, that's true. Uh, Riverside Ballroom was certain days was for Hispanic entertainment. Other days were for country Western, and uh, it was uh, located just off of uh, just a uh, above the, the Salt River. 
and it was a very popular place to come to listen to. Uh, but again, it it it, uh, it it was basically aimed at different cultures, and uh, but but it was very popular with the folks in Phoenix. And um, I know on the uh, pictures that you show, uh, Pete Bogarin, Pedro Bogarin, born in. Uh, uh, outside of where Sun City is, uh, Marionette was called, and he became very famous in Arizona, New Mexico, and California. He had a band, and he would play uh, very, very popular here in Phoenix, and would play in the Riverside Ballroom and also in uh, Calderon Ballroom in, in South Phoenix. So yeah, so it was, I mean, between those two, that they were both happening spots. Oh, it, it, absolutely. The place to be. <laughs> yeah, indeed. All right. So let's get ready for some answers. All right. So who was the first Anglo baby born in Arizona? Gila Howard. I think we missed the D there, but. I, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, the picture jumped up somehow. There you go. Uh, let me uh, mention uh, Gila uh, in 1848, after the war with Mexico, Arizona, uh, north of the Gila River, became part of the United States. And in 1850, there was a couple on a, a raft. If you can believe this, they were floating down the Gila River uh, in the area where Gila Bend is today, 1850. And uh, the wife, uh, Mrs. Howard, was pregnant. So they put the boat to the shore. She had the baby. And because the baby was born on the Gila River, they decided to call it Gila. And, and uh, uh, they got back on the, on the raft and continued down to the Colorado River and uh, eventually to California. In all probability, uh, uh, they were going to the gold rush in California. But he, you can say first Anglo baby, first baby born uh, of an Anglo couple after Arizona became uh, part of the United States. Again, the Gila River was the boundary. So had the baby bo been born on the southern boundary, it still would have been Mexico. <laughs> the Gadsden Purchase, of course, uh, extended the boundaries and eventually it included the boundary that we now have for Arizona. All right. And question two, what Since year was the largest flood for the salt river? In the answer was 1891, 300,000 cubic feet per second hit the, uh, the salt river through the Phoenix area. Uh, I, I notice you show the picture of uh, uh, the. This is a picture you show is uh, at the Tempe area, but there's another picture that shows that from the 1891 flood, the water from the Salt River reached Central and Jefferson in downtown Phoenix, and uh, that we never saw a flood that large again. 300,000 cubic feet per second is is a lot of water, <clears throat> and um, but what it did was it created a floodplain area for Phoenix. Everything south of Phoenix uh, became in the floodplain where before people were building nice homes in South Phoenix. But after that, if you wanted to, if you had money and you're gonna build a nice home, it was gonna be north of Phoenix because, and, and the end result was many of the mi minorities who couldn't afford property or uh, they started buying up land south of Phoenix because it was cheaper. And so the Chinese, Mexican, black communities started uh, communities south of Phoenix. But a good part of that was because uh, nobody realized that south of Phoenix was in a floodplain. And as you can see, the distance between the Salt River and Jefferson and Central is quite a distance for the yeah. floodplain to reach. Wow. That was a heck of a lot of water coming in. A lot. Never we to date we've not seen that much water come through Phoenix. All right. Question three: What famous person is buried on a hilltop just outside of Florence? 
The answer is Charles Poston. And in many books, he's considered the father of Arizona. Uh, Charles was a, um, a, a lobbyist for a mining company. He came to Arizona very, very early. And uh, he, uh, he went to Washington, D.C. on behalf of the mining companies who wanted Arizona to be a territory of the United States. So the <clears throat> soldiers would, the United States would send soldiers to protect against Apaches. And he personally lobbied Abraham Lincoln, and he finally succeeded in Arizona in 1863, became a territory of the United States. And Charles Poston had a lot to do with that. In fact, uh, they had a vote, and they, he was the representative to the House of Representatives uh, representing Arizona territory. And, uh, but, but Charles, was uh, he liked to drink a lot. And uh, he stayed in, in the Arizona area, but uh, he was an attorney. He had an office and a bar in downtown Phoenix and eventually ended up penniless and uh, a homeless person in the streets of Phoenix. And he died that way, penniless on the streets of Phoenix. And um, they buried him. And many years later, uh, the um, Daughters of the American Revolution and some other folks got together and decided that they didn't want him in a pauper's grave in downtown Phoenix. So they dug him up, took him to the hilltop on Florence, Arizona, built a pyramid to uh, honor him. And the question is, why Florence? Well, according to the story, uh, he once told he was once lived in Florence for a while. And he pointed to the hilltop outside of Florence, and he said, "You, he was not. He would be a place for a temple. He was not a Christian. I believe he was a Zoroaster. But he said uh, someday he would build a temple on top of that mound. And he, of course, he never did. So when the people that wanted to honor him, they dug him up and put him on top of the hill. The pyramid is still there." There's a, there's a road that leads up to the top, but it's uh, highly vandalized, but the pyramid is still there. Wow, that's crazy. And not the only famous person in Arizona buried in a pyramid. No, in fact, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the governor, Hunt, uh, uh, Governor Hunt was the first elected uh, when we became a state. And uh, when he died, he wanted to be buried in a pyramid also. And so he's on Tempe, uh, out towards Tempe, there's a, a pyramid there where uh, Governor Hunt is buried. What's interesting is when uh, Poston was buried in the early 1900s, uh, Governor Hunt was there at the funeral. Maybe he got the idea Oh, a pyramid, and and let it be known that when he died, he wanted to have a pyramid over his grave also. So, uh, but that's speculation. Nobody really knows <laughs> when they dedicated that pyramid for Poston. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. All right. So, where was Mobile located? Well, Mobile, Arizona was an all-black community. I actually visited there once. Uh, in, today, it doesn't exist. There's, there's nothing left of Mobile except the, uh, there's a graveyard there. And uh, But I remember I was in my 20s, I think, and I drove through Mobile, and it was a bu bunch of very uh, poor little shacks. And the only big building in the town was uh, the Galilee Baptist Church. And it was all black people because... Uh, Early Arizona was very discriminatory to blacks. It was no different than the South. They they did wouldn't even allow them in the town. So several black people went out in the middle of the desert and uh, created a town uh, and and called it Mobile, Arizona. And the town was west of Mar where Maricopa, Arizona, is today. And again, I, I say that there's nothing left of the town but it was an all black community uh, with, with uh, the biggest structure was the, uh, was the ba Galilee Baptist church. And there was a watering hole nearby where the, the blacks uh, baptized their, their people when they were born there. Ah. Again, 
a little bit of a, a sad history that they had to create their own town in the middle of the desert because they, they couldn't, uh, weren't allowed, did not fit in to where the cities were. Well, and I didn't realize it was no longer a town. So I actually went out there at one point and all that's really left with the name Mobile is a cemetery and there's a school. And other than that, that's it. The I mean, school, I think, came in later, but the school is, is, wasn't part of Mobile. It was part of uh, 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 something else. But Mobile was, I remember driving through it. And it, one time they had several uh, little lean-tos almost. Very poor people were living there. And in fact, I'll give you a little bit, uh, um, um, uh, the, the black um, uh, representative for the city of Phoenix, uh, uh, Calvin Good. Calvin Good has kind of taken Mobile under his wing. And he, he uh, unofficially looks after the history of uh, Mobile. There was a lot of black people that uh, were born and raised there in, in Mobile. That, and, but he kind of, uh, I've talked to him many times about Mobile and it's kind of, uh, it, it holds a special part in his heart. Understand. Well, I didn't realize he was in. He was involved in the preservation of that. That's great. Yeah, there's not much preservation because there's nothing much left. But the one thing that is there, and that someday maybe something can be done, is there's a fairly large graveyard there of the people that are buried there. And and of course, there's no protection or nothing for those those graves. And uh, someday maybe uh, a fence can be built around it or or, or some kind of protection. Uh, uh, in the future because uh, honoring people who were part of Arizona history. All right. And who was Benjamin Franklin? Uh, he was an Arizona state territorial governor. And uh, uh, Benjamin uh, was appointed by the president of the United States in um, 1896 to be the governor of um uh, uh, of Arizona, and he moved in. He was a Southerner too. It was interesting because this was after the Civil War, and uh, but he was very political, and he was appointed governor of Arizona. He didn't live very long. He died two years later in 1898. He's buried in the Pioneer Cemetery. He's got a grave there uh, where he died and was uh, buried. Um, it's interesting too if you read his history. Uh, he as most politicians, uh, they like to stretch the truth a little bit. Uh, he used to always say, well, I'm related to the other Benjamin Franklin. But every signs that appear show that they were in two different parts of the world and that in all probability, he just happened to have the same name as the original Benjamin Franklin. But he didn't uh, stop for a second to try to tell people that he was related to uh, uh, the other Benjamin Franklin. Uh, and again, uh, uh, politics doesn't change, even though that's over 100 years ago. <laughs> Indeed. All right. So who was Hattie Mosier? Uh, my mother would tell me about Hattie Mosier because uh, she was the talk of early Phoenix. Uh, and um, she died in 1945. But Hattie was born to one of the richest families in, uh, in, their, in all of Arizona. Even her father uh, uh, created an ice machine in the early uh, turn of the century. And it was very popular. He, uh, nobody had invented something to make ice. And his invention went all over the world. And so he became very rich. And Hattie grew up a very rich young woman. And she married, had one daughter. Uh, her husband left her. And Hattie, in 1922, ran for the state legislature. Uh, she didn't win, but she ran for it. And uh, But she also was not only active politically, but she was always suing the city of Phoenix because of their zoning requirements that she was very upset with. She lost her entire fortune to attorneys in lawsuits against the city. So she found herself as she grew older, uh, penniless on the streets of Phoenix. And people would talk about Hattie, they'd see her walking the streets. My mother would tell me she would, uh, uh, it was a joke to see Hattie, she would wear clothes back to the early uh, 
1900s or so. Uh, she wasn't, uh, and luckily enough, she didn't live on the street because one of the hotels that she had once owned, the manager let her sleep in the back room somewhere. And uh, like I said, she died, finally died in 1945. Uh, a very interesting career, but uh, I think uh, her most famous uh, position, I, if you talk to any of the old timers of Phoenix that were in uh, Phoenix in the 40s, uh, will tell you all about Hattie Mosier. She, she was, uh, she, when she died, she made the front page of the Arizona Republic. One, I know, I know in the 70s, um, there was the Sahara Hotel downtown, and so they had a bar named for Hattie. Because even in the 70s, I mean, she had kind of developed this whole backstory and her name was still really well known even at that point. Um, somebody did ask where the Pioneer Cemetery is. It is over on Jefferson and 13th Avenue and takes up pretty much two city blocks. That That is correct. It's uh, actually closer to three that, uh, that they take a big area. And it is the, the oldest... Uh, uh, established cemetery of, in uh, Phoenix, and buried there is uh, uh, many of the uh, Daryl Dupa, the man who named Phoenix, uh, uh, jo uh, Jacob Waltz, the, the, the famous legend of the Superstition Mountains, buried and there. And need the Lost Dutchman. He's not lost, just his gold. Yeah, that's right. He's buried there in the Pioneer Cemetery. King Wolsey, Benjamin Franklin, uh, a lot of Chinese, a lot of uh, uh, Chinese buried there, a lot of Hispanics. Uh, it's interesting, even though there was a lot of segregation in early Phoenix, uh, uh, they didn't segregate when you died. But in the South, I think they did in places. But at least in Phoenix, uh, uh, there was a, a mix of uh, different uh, people of different uh, races buried in that cemetery. It runs from around 13th Avenue to 15th Avenue and, and heads south to the railroad tracks. Right. All right. So question seven, who was the first non-Indian woman to live in Phoenix? Trinidad Escalante was her name. And a very religious woman, very good woman. She, she was born in Edmosillo, Sonora. And uh, she was like, I don't know, I, I don't have the age, but she was very young when she married Jack Swilling. She was the wife of Jack Swilling, who's always thought of as one of the founders of Phoenix. And uh, uh, Jack, of course, had a lot of problems. Uh, he was addicted to laudrum because of some wounds he had from the Civil War, and he also was an alcoholic. So mixing dope and booze doesn't make for a very good person. But Jack uh, uh, Swilling had seven children with Trinidad, and uh, all was a very, the first mass, Catholic mass, ever said in Phoenix was said at, at the home of Jack Swilling, not at the request of Jack Swilling, but at the request of Trinidad. And uh, when Jack was dying, uh, uh, and, and when he was dying in, in Yuma, they asked him, uh, how about your poor wife? And he said, well, I, I think I treated her well, but when I was on drugs and drinking, I don't remember what I did. So my guess is uh, she suffered a lot with Jack. Uh, he was up and down. He was basically, seemed to be a decent person, but uh, went on drugs and drinking, he became a different person. And then she, after he died, she remarried and had three children, uh, and her second husband was also an alcoholic and killed himself. And uh, her second husband and Trinidad are buried in the St. Francis Cemetery. Trinidad died in 1925. Uh, a very good woman uh, who suffered a lot with bad husbands. Ah. <laughs> uh. That's a horrible story. And then on to another story. So who was the last person to be hung in Arizona? Eva Dugan. And Eva was an interesting lady. She was tough as nails. Uh, she had been, uh, they say, before she came to Arizona, she had been a prostitute. Uh, 
Uh, she had done a lot of things. She was up in Alaska in the gold rush era area and came to Arizona in the twenties, thirties. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, she was always looking to make a living and she hooked up with, a, an individual, um, uh, Andy Mathis was his name. He hired her, uh, made me part lover, part hire, but he got rid of her and she turned around and killed him. And, um, uh, they arrested her, uh, put her in jail and she was in trial on trial. And, um, uh, the jury found her guilty and, uh, uh, sentenced her to death by hanging. And it's interesting. Uh, the last, she told the judge, she, it was an all male jury that sentenced her. And she said, uh, you're all going to die of old age and suffering. I'm lucky. I get to go out at the prime of my life, she told me. And uh, so with that, they took her to Florence, to the prison, and hung her. And I believe the date was uh, uh, 1933, I think, is uh, 1925 was the year mm -hmm. that she was hung. Okay. And um, she, um, uh, when they hung her, she was a heavy set woman. And they didn't do the calculations right because they pulled her head off of her body. So you had her head in one place and her body spouting blood with all the people. They said some of the, the, the people that were watching this, some of them passed out when they saw this. Well, that was too much for the uh, state of Arizona. So they said, you know what? We're not going to have this again. So they eliminated uh, hanging and, and went to gas chambers. And so Eva was the last person hung in Arizona. And of course, your, your picture is here of Eva. Indeed. All right. And so where is the famous Arizona Mormon pioneer, Jacob, Jacob Hamblin, buried? Jacob was um, a very interesting person, probably one of the most famous of the Mormon pioneers, uh, uh, he lived a good part of his life in St. George, Utah, and uh, but he was a explorer. He explored in many parts of Arizona. He was very close to the Indians. He converted a lot of Indians and Paiutes into the Mormon faith. But he appears to be a very decent individual. He, uh, some of the early Mormons from the St. George area, uh, you know, this is where the Mountain Meadows massacre occurred, but, but Jacob seems like uh, uh, he was tried to do the right thing. And in fact, one of the things he did was when uh, Colonel uh, John Powell uh, was on the Colorado river uh, and three of his men left the expedition and were never heard of again. Uh, Powell went to St. George and hired Jacob Hamlin to take him to try to find what happened to his three men. And uh, Jacob Hamlin took him to the Paiutes, and uh, he could speak Paiute, but uh, Powell could not. And he translated that the Indians had said they killed him. Well, later stories show that it may have been the Mormons who killed the three men. But, but Hamlin was protecting, uh, of course, with the, with the Mount Meadows massacre, and they found out that Mormons killed uh, Powell's people, it would have been a disastrous thing for the, the whole area. So, he, But then later on, the United States outlawed polygamy, and Jacob had several wives. So he was on the run with the U.S. Uh, Army and the Federals after him trying to put him in jail for polygamy. And in uh, his run to get away from him, he was in New Mexico when he died, and he was buried there in the, somewhere in New Mexico. Well, his daughter had a family in Alpine, Arizona, and she wanted Jacob to be buried there where she was. So she went out into New Mexico, dug up Jacob, and brought him to Alpine. And he's got, a, a as you show in the picture, he's got a very nice headstone that uh, his daughter had made for him. And uh, he's buried there now in Alpine, Arizona. Wow. All right, and now we're at our very last question. Who was the first female admiral of the Arizona Navy? 
first of all, there is no such thing as the Arizona Navy, as you might think. But Nelly, uh, what happened, There's a, the, the story is that in 1934, Metropolitan Water District of California was looking for water. Uh, you know, the movie Chinatown talks a little bit. Metropolitan District was a very corrupt group in those days. And, uh, getting water for the growth of Los Angeles, uh, people were killed in the process. Well, they had a lot of political pull, and they got the uh, United States government to agree to uh, build a dam on the Colorado River uh, uh, near Parker, and and uh, uh, the dam would back the water up to allow Metropolitan Water District to pump water out of the Colorado River and take it to Los Angeles. Well, Arizona was furious because we didn't have the clout that California had. So uh, uh, Arizona objected to this. They said what they're doing is taking Arizona's water and taking it to Los Angeles. Well, tough luck, Arizona, California said. We have the votes in Congress. We're going to do it. Well, the construction crews started showed up to build uh, the Parker Dam there at, uh, on the Colorado River. Arizona sent the National Guard to the river. They had oh. tanks. There were tanks on the Arizona side with the tanks aimed at, uh, towards California. And uh, uh, th and what they did is Nellie Bush was running a ferry boat uh, to cross the Colorado River between Arizona and New Mexico. Here's a picture of her on her ferry boat. Well, the, the Arizona National Guard mounted a machine gun on her ferry boat. And, and uh, uh, of course, the construction crew showed up, found tanks aimed at them, and uh, Nellie's ferry boat had a machine gun with a machine gunner on it. Well, they quickly turned around. But this hit the national news. With New York City, Los Angeles, they thought this was... This wasn't 1834. This was 1934, and it hit the news everywhere. And the front page of the New York newspaper read, "Arizona, the Arizona." Uh, they found out what they did find out was Nellie was the one that was running the boat on the ferry with the machine gun on it. So they called her Arizona's Admiral of the Arizona Navy. Uh, and and uh, Los Angeles had huge articles. It was, uh, uh, I mean, this was something that made news everywhere. Nellie was a very little known woman in uh, uh, living in Parker, Arizona, running this little bit of a ferry. And all of a sudden, her name was all over the United States, everywhere. And Nellie became so famous, she ran for the state legislature and was elected several times. She was one of the, the first of the female state legislators because of her fame as the admiral of the Arizona Navy in the battle against California. And, of course, uh, Cal Arizona backed off. Parker Dam got built. MWD built their pumping plant and took water, took a million acre feet of water out of the Colorado River and sent it to Los Angeles. And it wasn't until many years later that Arizona built the Central Arizona Project, and we finally got our the water that uh, we so valiantly fought for over the years, which California kept taking. California tr contributes no water to the Colorado. Arizona contributes several locations, the Little Colorado, the um, San, uh, Santa Maria River. There's several places that Arizona, the Gila River, contributes water to the Colorado, yet we... The only water we were taking out of the Colorado was in the Yuma area. And finally, when the CAP was uh, uh, approved, we started taking water into central Arizona. Wow. And all because she had a little ferry shuttling across from California to Arizona. Oh, yeah. She was, <laughs> boy, they loved her. And they had an election. She won the election, became a state legislature. Uh, she was, was th that one event made her famous through the entire United States. And my understanding is, if you'd have bought a newspaper in New York City, there was a, a talk about Nellie Bush, the admiral of the Arizona Navy. <laughs> wow. 
So Frank, I know I showed earlier your book about Mexicans in Phoenix. Is that the only book that you've written? No, I um, I also co-authored a book on the history of Chicanos por la Causa with Santos Vega. And it's it's not a book, it's more of a pamphlet uh, on the history of how they uh, they were, were started. But my latest one, in November 9th, I just finished a book in the, with uh, the History Press, which is a subsidiary of Arcadia Publishing. And it's called The History of the Phoenix Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul is the uh, largest St. Vincent de Paul in Phoenix, is the largest St. Vincent de Paul in the entire world. We're in 150 uh, countries throughout the world. And uh, uh, we have a headquarters in, uh, uh, in, in St. Louis, Missouri, but Phoenix, Arizona, which St. Vincent de Paul started in 1946 here in Phoenix, grew. And today we're the largest, most successful St. Vincent de Paul in the entire world. And I put together this book that tells the history of how we started and how we became the largest St. Vincent de Paul in the world, uh, dedication of people, support from companies. Uh, it, it's a great story. And I, uh, I just uh, tell people the book will be out November 9th. Uh, it's coming up and uh, you'll find a fantastic history, how we grew from a few people uh, wanting to help the poor at St. Mary's Catholic Church, which then grew to where we are today. Wow. All right. Well, I look forward to getting a chance to see that book. And Frank, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to hang out with us and share some of your amazing stories. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now it's time for Little Arizona. So really started doing Little Arizona. I was supposed to be working on a book um, with that idea, looking at small towns across Arizona, because as we all know, we've got the fifth largest city in the country right here in Phoenix, as well as growing up in a small town in Indiana of about 25 people, I kind of have an affinity for that small town experience. And Arizona has a whole bunch of really cool small towns. And so really, it was a chance to really highlight those and getting a chance to talk about them as opposed to just going wherever. So we are talking today about Happy Jack. So basically, Happy Jack is kind of up near Sedona. Prescott up in that area. And so it was originally, so it is in Cho Cochise County, has just under 600 people living there. So just a little tiny place. In fact, here is their post office. And I would argue that probably one of the smallest post offices in Arizona. So, I mean, it originally was started back in 1947. So it's a re relatively new town, but it was originally built as a logging camp. Prior to that, it was what was called the Long Valley. And as, as the demand for lumber grew, so did the town. Now, we're not sure. I've seen various stories about where the name came from for Happy Jack. Some say it came from the Lumberjacks. I've also seen that it was based on a happy-go-lucky employee of the lumbery mill. There's also a story about how it was named that because of a bandit in Wyoming that was called Happy Jack. And so someone decided to name the town after him there. Now, that original town site was basically kind of that original camp was purchased at one point and has become the Happy Jack Lodge and RV Park. So you can go stay in that same area from what I was able to find, it looks like the only kind of remaining thing from really that time period seems to be the fireplace at the lodge. Everything else is new build, trying to look old, but still, I mean, what a great little fireplace. 
And what a great little place to just kind of go and get away from it all. So remember, if you have any questions, stories, suggestions, or comments, you can put them here in the chat. You can also reach out via email. Now, next week, I'm happy to say, oh my gosh, again, we're going to have so much fun. We're going to talk about some history of Scottsdale through my friend Brad, who has a great story, as well as his, his wife, Laura. So that's going to be really fun. And if all things go as planned, the cocktail next week will be infused with mesquite from Herb Drinkwater's tree in his very own front yard when he lived in that house. So I think next week's cocktail will be ex oh so special. So I'm really looking forward to that and seeing what PJ can kind of whip up. So also coming up on September 19th as part of Arizona Virtual Pride, doing a program on Arizona drag history where we have folks like Barbara Seville, Davina Ross, Millie Bloodworth talking about that history that is right here, talking about some of those stories of people and places that were here. And some of them are still here. And then I'm happy to say, you know, Deb and I for the last few years have been doing bus tours of kind of central Phoenix. And really we know that bus tours are not going to be a thing this year. So trying to figure out what that looks like. So what we're going to do is right now, if you go to hiphistorian.com, you can click on events and you will find right now there are two tours on the second weekend of October. On that Friday and Saturday, we are doing tours of 10 people, no more, requiring everyone to wear masks that cover their nose and their mouth. Um, I've got a little microphone that I can wear that attaches to a speaker on my hip so people will be able to hear me. And so that's kind of what we're doing to just kind of keep seeing some of those stories alive. So we'll be walking around downtown talking about some of the history as well as some of the buildings, as well as even an area where Charles Poston, we talked about earlier where he passed away and kind of how he, even just him dying in a certain location, kept a name and a story alive. And so there'll be more about that. Um, so if you'd like to feel free to go onto the website and take a look at that. So again, I want to thank you all for joining us. Now, this only really happens because of you all out there being so generous, as well as some sponsorship from AARP. And they like to say the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we're not alone. AARP is right here in Arizona, providing information that can help you and your family. Their website is www.aarp.org slash az. So I would also like to give a shout out to the folks that put together that amazing intro that we start the show off with always. And so that is my friend, Cole Travis, who wrote the mu and basically created that music from scratch, as well as the videographer, Chris Allen. And of course, the amazing PJ Vader Baron, who is our cocktail advisor and does an amazing job of curating all of the cocktails that we've been having. I mean, this one is oh so tasty. I mean, I think I'm going to even eat the coffee beans when I'm done with the cocktail. I know it's eight o'clock or a little after, you know, a little caffeine never hurt anybody. So again, thank you all so much for being here. We will see you right here. And there is a list of how you can reach out to me via Facebook, Marshall Shore Hip Historian, Instagram, Hip Historian, or also email hello at Hip Historian and the website. If you want to find out more information about those tours, it's right there at hiphistorian.com. And you can find more information about that. So again, thank you all so much for being here and letting us share in all so much history as we keep going on. I mean, this was week 21 and we're going to keep going and just sharing so much more history. 
So again, thank you all so much for being here and have a great rest of your Thursday night. So I'm going to go with our outro, which is actually found film footage from the 50s of right here in Arizona. The music was composed by Mr. Ho, who actually is from Sunny Slope and is now on the East Coast with kind of his own orchestra. So... <laughs>